Uh, lines 33 through 35 are the code to walk through the items in a list. It's a for loop. And what you do is you set list ob equal to list first ob of the old list and the address of the iterator. So what that does is uh, uh, we're passing in the address of the original list as the first argument, the pointer to the iterator, which is going to be used a little bit later on to help us walk through. And it simply returns the Saturn address of the first object within the list. And again, if the list actually contains a pointer to an object, it will resolve that. It will always return the pointer to the object, not, not the pointer to the pointer. There. Line 34 in that for list is simply checking to see whether you got an object. If the list was empty, then list first op would have returned a, a null pointer. And line 35 is how you go to the next object within the list. You call list next op, you pass it the address of that iterator that got passed in the first time, and it will return the next object within the list. So again, fairly simple code in order to be able to walk through a list. <coughs> and then the rest looks fairly similar from the others. So now we have an, uh, an object from the list. We simply say, well, if that's real, then call the increment real <coughs> function. Uh, if it's a zint, then call the increment zint function to, again, to create an object that is the previous one plus one. If it's something else, then I'm just going to return whatever that original <coughs> list object was. So just going to use whatever was in there already. Uh, line 45 closes that for loop. So by the time, oh, I'm sorry, and 44 takes whatever that new object is, that incremented list, dumps it into the next item in the array, and then increments the pointer, uh, the, the index within the array. That's the i variable. So by the time you're done walking through this list at line 46, you have created in that ARR array uh, pointers to the new objects that are going to go into the new list. Each of the new objects is the previous, ob uh, the previous object plus one. So then to create a list on line 46, we call list encode n, uh, which is one way of creating a list. There are a couple different ways. This one takes a, uh, an array, the number of items in the array, and the address of where you want to put the list. So I is the number of items in the array. ARR was that array that we had. And as before, we just want to create the list within tempop and have it uh, created with however much space it needs. And finally, at line 47, we just push that new list on using the same code that we had before. You can push any object on using that push. That's all text of essentially what I've just described. There are a few functions that will work with any object, because um, these come in handy. Uh, is ob simply says, do I have an object at this address? Because sometimes you need to know that. Uh, ob nibbles will return how big an object is in nibbles. Uh, again, for any object type, you can pass in any object in these. Uh, skip ob simply uh, returns the address after the current object. Um, and as you can imagine, that simply takes whatever the source is and adds the value from OB nibbles. Uh, OB copy will copy an object from the source to the destination, but only if the destination already contains something of the same size. It's very important within the calculator memory that, that the objects be, um, uh, be lined up absolutely contiguously. So where one object stops, the next one must start. If you don't have that, you're going to crash the calculator. A few functions for using the stack. You can get the stack depth. Uh, pop an item, pop anything off the stack. It'll just return the address of the, uh, the object that was there. Push anything on the stack. Okay, and the really neat thing with all of this, the, the takeaway for all of this, is that you can get rid of wrapper code. If anybody, if any of you have used the, the C compiler to write code on the calculator, what you've probably realized is that you usually have to create some sort of a wrapper in user RPL or system RPL or whatever to take your data in whatever form your <coughs> program creates it in and then simplify it in some way. Put it into a string, put it into something or other. And then the C code would usually use the string or something, create typically a string to put it back on, and then your wrapper would have to, to tear that all apart. 
So I, I wrote a program, the first program that I wrote in C was a, to solve Sudoku puzzles. You're probably all familiar with this. Well, 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 actually, I had, I had a Sudoku solver for, um, uh, for Windows. And I thought, well, this would be interesting to put on. And I actually got it on, and it worked pretty well. Now, the, the problem there is for the user interface, I wanted them to be able to use the, uh, you know, to, to basically just key in an array. But I had no idea how to get a C program to access that array at the time. So I wrote a little wrapper code that took the array, the 9 by 9 array, converted it into a string, an 81 character string, where each string was either the number <coughs> of space and a like that. that string went into the C code. The C code would decode the string, figure out what it all meant, solve the puzzle, and then put another string back on the, on the stack that would contain the result. And then the wrapper code would take that resulting string, convert it back into a 9 by 9 array. Wonderful, great, fine. And, and all of this could solve really any puzzle in less than three seconds. And I thought, this is great. This thing just wails. So then after I did HP objects, I thought, well, gee, I think I can eliminate one of these steps. I can just have you know, read the array directly and create an array directly. So I went back. It took, it took, I think, less than an hour to change this. And then I timed it. And the result came back. It was a tenth of a second. It was 30 times faster. To do this. Now think about that. That means that the user RPL code to simply take an array, convert it to a string, and then take the string and convert it back to an array took 30 times more th than, than the code to actually solve a Sudoku puzzle. Right? I mean, and that's not that easy to do, to solve those things. That gives you a sense of how much faster the C code is in these things. So that's really the takeaway, is that if you want to try to write C code and, on this thing, it's, it's incredibly fast. The calculator really is, and with this library, you can you can do it without having to resort to funny things to to get the data in and out of the C code. There are limitations, of course, as with everything. Um, one of the worst ones is it won't let you add or remove an identifier from a directory, and the real problem there is that if you if you put something in a directory in the home directory to change a variable it actually changes the size of the entire thing which means that all of the memory has to get moved around all the pointers to it have to get changed there's a lot of work involved in that and i didn't even want to try to take that on so sorry but you can't uh, you can't put anything in the directory if you were, if you were decreasing you could create a dummy object to, to, to occupy the you, you could space. yeah yeah you could but there, it, yeah yeah, yeah. Um, it's very difficult to grow or shrink an object like a list because there can't be any empty space, as I was just mentioning. Uh, there's no way to do garbage collection in the Saturn address space, or at least there's no way for you know, that I've figured out to, to do that. So if you create a whole bunch of objects that you're then not going to use or throw away, you might end up running out of space in the Saturn, uh, Saturn space while you're doing that. Um, and I, I mentioned that it supports all of the objects. Well, the library object itself is very minimal uh, support. Really, all I do is I can figure out how big it is. Uh, but I, I thought the library object, which is by far the most complicated one, um, I thought nobody's going to use C code to access libraries. I figured nobody's going to use this stuff at all. So, <laughs> so I figured no, no, no reason to do that. Uh, conclusions, it's flexible. It's easy to use. It's very complete. Um, lets you read and write these objects pretty easily. And then references, um, the code itself is on hpcalc.org, so you've all got it on your, your CDs that Eric provided. Um, a wonderful resource for HPGCC is Egan Ford's tutorial page. I would recommend that as the first place to go if you, if you want to try programming in this stuff. Um, Right, and the detailed description of the, uh, the calculator objects themselves are in part five of Introduction to Saturn Assembly Language Programming. There are a couple different formats of that available. And you can reach me at davidmaru.com. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah, uh, once you've compiled your program on your PC, uh, could you give us some clues to how you, you get it into the, into the 50G and, and, and how does it like become an entry in a menu yeah, somewhere? Yeah. You, you transfer it in just as with any other calculator object, just using the, mm. uh, the connectivity kit. Um, so it, it will land in there uh, right on the stack or, or in a variable, I guess. Is and then you save it as a? Well, it, it, gets, it, it, it lands in the, uh, uh, in the variable as a string. 
and then you have to actually run a program on the calculator, the program that comes with the compiler, to convert that into something that can actually execute on the calculator. So there's, there's a bit of a two-step process there. This isn't my field, but that never stopped me before. <laughs> what you're saying is that doing the crunching in C is so much faster that it more than pays for all of the encoding and decoding that you have to do yes. to make it. Oh work. yeah, yeah, absolutely. You, you can't see, you can't conceive that that the encoding and decoding could take up more time. It, I mean, I suppose there might be cases where it could, but I certainly haven't run into any. Yeah, if you're just going to add two numbers together. So, so, yeah, so um, you write your code you put it in the calculator, and there's object which you can execute, yes. and that will grab data off the stack. Right. And program right. Itself. Could you repeat the question, please? <coughs> okay, so the question is um, uh, any C code runs on the other one? Yes. Mm -hmm. And, and, and yeah. the do, do, do you not hold um, Oh, uh, the, the, the question is sort of the, if the C code is running on the ARM, is it also running on the Saturn? And, and the answer is no. It's, it's actually, um, I don't know the details of how they have this set up, but once they, they create the memory, put the C code in, the, in there, oh, Tim's got his hand up, so he'll. So the way the launch program works is actually grabs enough memory um, to do some code shifting grabs all of the registers used in the ARM, saves those somewhere into memory, then points at the C code, jumps to that, so you're now completely out of the emulator, executes the code natively, and then at the end, it restores all of the registers back to where you were, and you're back where you're at. So it's basically bypassing the emulator and then running the, the C code directly. Well, well, uh, all uh, that the one that we tell you, you have a uh, 41 maybe called uh, the C code, no, the C code is not pointing into the ROM of the machine. It's, oh, it's loaded in, into RAM. Right, right. It's loading into RAM and then off. I'm sorry, you had a comment? No? Okay. I'll just say all that is still faster. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you.